Hi, Mike Gibson coming to you live from AHA 2019, and I'm joined by Catherine Wildman, and we're talking about familial hypercholesterolemia. Talk to us a little bit about the scope of the problem. I mean, how many people are there out there with familial hypercholesterolemia? It's actually the most common life-threatening genetic condition. It's estimated that about 1 in 250 people wow. live with familial hypercholesterolemia. So that is slightly more in the U.S. than the um, type 1 diabetes wow. community. Um, and 34 million people approximately worldwide. The wow. interesting thing, unlike a lot of genetic conditions, is that familial hypercholesterolemia also affects every race and ethnicity. It's been found all over the world. And how, does it, how do we come to diagnose it? So, familial hypercholesterolemia is a genetic condition, but it was first understood as a phenotype with a clinical diagnosis here in the United States where genetic testing is not as prevalent as it is in Europe and some other countries or regions of the world. It is still primarily diagnosed through an LDL level, um, a family history, strong family history of premature cardiovascular disease, and some people also have phys physical signs of actual cholesterol buildup on their hands or elbows or, or Achilles tendons, but that's really the most severely impacted. So the AHA um, scientific statement on familial hypercholesterolemia really put forth the case definition of FH as an LDL above 190 and a strong family history mm -hmm. of premature cardiovascular disease. And what if someone comes in with a heart attack and gets diagnosed with FH or familial hypercholesterolemia, what steps should then be taken with their family members? So FH is an autosomal dominant condition, so it's easily inherited, and every first-degree family member will have a 50% chance. It's really a flip of the coin for each family member, whether or not, first-degree relative, whether or not they have familial hypercholesterolemia. Sadly, we know that family screening is not taking place in the U.S. and around much of the world. The Center for Disease Control actually designated FH as one of three Tier 1 applications for family screening. Um, there are only three, BRCA, Lynch, and then FH. Um, but in our fragmented healthcare system, it's very challenging um, to actually pull that through into care. Is that a knowledge gap, or is it a, you know, healthcare application gap, or why? Why aren't more people being tested whose family member has this? So we see both. We see that um, it's not well understood how FH is inherited how easily it's inherited, um, and also how critical it is to find individuals young and um, to treat them. And frankly, who's going to be reimbursed for taking that time? Who owns that role of helping educate an individual and mm -hmm. reaching out to the family, helping them to reach out to their family members? Because with HIPAA, uh. the f it's really on incumbent on that person to reach out I to see. their family members in the U.S. And what are the treatment options we have right now? So we've had statins for 30 years. As, as everybody knows, um, it's amazing to see how many individuals with FH are, are not on statins, even though that is the gold standard. Um, for those who are most severely impacted, we have drugs specifically for, like, lamidipide. We actually, for those who've inherited two mutations, have blood cleansing, you know, LDL, apheresis. Mm. It's been really exciting in the last three years to see PCSK9 inhibitors mm -hmm. come mm -hmm. onto the market, um, although we see only um, up to 3% of the FH population who is known in the United States is actually prescribed PCSK9 inhibitors. And this is a population that from birth has extraordinarily high cholesterol and very recalcitrant cholesterol levels. So um, by the time they're 40, their arteries look like they're 80, essentially. Is that so I saying? have familial hypercholesterolemia. And mm -hmm. part of how I got into this work is I had a heart attack at 39. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it, we see that the level of risk is extreme. Yeah. Um, and it's really that the time period that people are exposed to LDL yeah. as a, and 
the level of the it's actual a lifetime LDL. of exposure to very high levels. So, why aren't more people being prescribed PCSK9 inhibitors? Is that they're not being prescribed, or are they not able to get the prescription filled? because of barriers. So it's both. Mm -hmm. The number one problem with familial hypercholesterolemia, which I don't think we said explicitly, is that in the U.S. at least 90 percent of people are still not diagnosed. Mm -hmm. So they and their care team do not understand that they're at such high risk. Mm -hmm. um, the FH Foundation actually advocated for an ICD-10 code for FH. There was none, and so mm. now we can measure okay. how many individuals with the E7801 code mm -hmm. actually are being prescribed. It's about 3%, and then it's about half a percent who actually go on to be on statins um, for a year. Wow. wow. So there are three different barriers, lack yeah. of diagnosis of the condition, lack of prescribing, we think, because many physicians aren't as familiar mm -hmm. with how urgent it is to treat this mm -hmm. population, and then, unfortunately, there are access barriers. Yeah. Well, thank you for your efforts to raise awareness and to improve this. It's really a major public health problem, I think. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. And thanks to all of you for joining us here live from AHA 2019.